Right. Good evening, everybody. Recording is in progress. So whatever you're doing, you're on camera now. So watch it. Uh, welcome to the May uh, membership meeting. Um, pretty soon we'll have the agenda up here. There we go. Okay, so we'll do, we'll walk around and do some check-ins. With the check-ins, there's a couple folks that will have a little more to say than just their name. They've got stuff in front of them that they would like to either give away, sell, or whatever. Um, I'll make a few opening comments, and we'll turn it over to Dave. Dave will talk to us about field day. Um, this is going to be a partial program on field day. Next month's meeting will be the full blown. This is where we are. This is for sure who's doing what this, you know, have all of the final details to kick it off. Then Charles is going to join us on zoom. He's up there on the cam on the um, screen right now to talk about chat GBT. And then open discussion uh, from everybody. Um, and if there's any officer updates or things, and then we'll do uh, uh, check out. So let me start wandering around the room with the microphone. We'll start over here with D. Hi, I'm D K U four G C Hillsboro. Uh, hi, I'm Sam K J four V W G uh, from Durham, and I have a bunch of these uh, older uh, Nortel. I think they're eleven nineties that I found in a junk store, and uh, I like to. Nor they're Nortel. I, I like to play with phones, so I tried one and, and it worked. And uh, I can help you configure it if you want one. I have I have more at home, but I took the whole bunch for like a couple dollars and tested them and upgraded them. Uh, I think I have one, two, three, four, five, six here, but more later if you need them. So the future anthropologists from another planet will come down and they'll say, "Who are these Nortel people that they were so interested in? Why did everybody talk to them?" A, uh, Steve Casey one X uh, have some goodies here. Um, low low price goodies. Oh, these are free. See, awesome. this, this is this is what happens with capitalism, right? Yes. Karen KD KD four YJZ Eflin. Uh, Dave W four SAR Eflin. Joe K4SAR, Northwest Durham. Bill, N8BR, uh, Chapel Hill. Dan, KR4UB, Chapel Hill. Sean, and, and 4 sjw North Chatham County. Dave, NA4VY, Cedar Grove. Bob, W4FK, Hillsboro. Paul, N2X at F, Botner. At KO4QLU, Durham. Barry, K2IX, uh, Carborough. And I have here a hot issue of QST, but I'd like it absolutely free. Feel free to take it. Uh, it I can't make it work. I, I'm not sure what's wrong with it. Good idea. I'm Charlie, KD4UCZ from Eflin, and an ex-Nortel engineer, so I'm having massive flashbacks right now. <laughs> Boyd, KO4GJO from Hillsboro. Uh, Mark, uh, Chapel Hill, uh, KR3AM, and my little company used to make software for Northern Telecom, so there you go, it's got the whole... Lori, N1YXU. And I'm going to go ahead and Brian, we'll get to you in one sec. I just want to say who is on Zoom. And can somebody just give me a thumbs, thumbs up on Zoom if you can hear us okay? Got it. Okay. All right. We have JRN4JQR, Fred, KN4QBZ, Charles, KY4HU, Steve, W3H. W3AHL, excuse me, Banks W4OSZ. And we have a person who is coming to us from around the world, Randy, 
uh, currently is call sign Bravo Victor eight slash Kilo Foxtrot for Oscar. He is actually in Taiwan and he is joining us tonight. He wins the best DX of the evening. <laughs> Brian K4 BMW uh, Hillsboro. I finally updated the QRZ. Okay, thank you and welcome everybody. I'm Bruce and one LN. Okay, uh, if we go back to the agenda now, just briefly, just for a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, in that um, QST, and also in some emails that you probably have received from the ARRL, if you're a member, there's currently a vote that ARRL is taking about the potential increase in the annual ARRL dues or fee or membership cost or whatever you would like to say it is. Um, it started May 1st, so it's open now. Uh, you have to be a member to vote, so I think probably a lot of you folks are. Um, I went online today just so I could see, you know, is this difficult? How long does it take? What are they really asking? And uh, if you click on the first link, you'll download a PDF that essentially is from the uh, uh, chairman of the board or president or whichever title he has, CEO, I think, um, which kind of talks about what they've been doing for the past few years and trying to maintain costs and the previous administration did a really good job doing that, but they're starting to run into some cost issues. Um, what the expenses are that they are having problems with. And then it asks for, uh, rather than for them to just say, well, we think we ought to do this. Let's get rid of these services. Let's add this much to the cost. Let's make this change. They don't want to do that because with most dues, things like that, you're not going to make everybody happy. You're going to eliminate the services maybe that some of the hams like, or you're going to make some kind of a change. That's not going to be a majority thing. So there's only about 10 questions. I think the whole thing, including downloading the PDF, we're going through the questions, answering the questions, putting in some of my own comments, because there's blank areas to provide feedback. I think it took me 15 minutes, maybe 20. So I encourage you to uh, make your opinions known and go on out there and fill out that survey uh, questionnaire. Okay, um, we have some bad news tonight to, to relay, which I just heard at the beginning of the meeting. Um, many of you remember Nick Seidlick, KA1HPM. Uh, many of us went to his services about a year and a half ago, maybe, something like that. Um, great guy. He was uh, Chatham County. He was uh, one of our repeater people, worked with Dan a lot. Uh, very involved in Oxcom. Um, that was kind of a surprise for his passing. This next one is more of a surprise. Yesterday, his son passed away. So that's Nick Seidlick Jr. And his call is KN4QBY. So uh, John called me to also let me know. Dan had already told me. But John is working with his wife uh, to try to put together a memorial service maybe for later this week. So look for an email. Uh, John's going to send it to me, I think, uh, and I'm going to send it out. And maybe, Dan, if I can ask you to forward it from our other email account, that'd be much appreciated. So, you know, if you're not on Groups.io, it'd be much easier if everybody would get on Groups.io, then we could have one way to communicate. And, you know, sometimes we miss people, so we try not to with the, both of us sending stuff. Some of you probably don't like getting two of the same thing. So the only way we can do that is have one thing centralized, but that's not the discussion here. We, you will find out some more details about the memorial service maybe later on this week. They're trying to do it uh, before the end of the week. Okay, so that's the opening comments. Um, let me turn it over to Dave and we can talk about Field Day 2023. And thanks, everyone. Um, well, uh, OCRA, along with its sister club, DFMA, has been very active in uh, field day for the past, uh, well, ever since I joined the club. Initially, it was just uh, OCRA itself and DFMA were having uh, separate operations. And then a little while back, we decided to stop competing against each other since so many memberships overlap between the two organizations. And uh, we did a joint field day. And once we did that, the scores really took off amazingly. 
uh, we were so doing so well that we even reached as much as number two nationally out of all the uh, uh, several thousand stations that were participating in field day, we ranked number two. So never could catch the Potomac Valley Radio Club because, well, they have towers and mega wattage and a few hundred people to help. So, uh, but we, we were proud of what we did. Uh, however, along came COVID and that kind of rejiggered everything. Uh, people couldn't come out to participate. And the ARO made some changes in rules where people could uh, still participate as a club in field day, but just operate individually from their homes. And we did uh, aggregate scores that way. Basically, you declared a club affiliation while working out of your home. And uh, when your field day site and all the people who declared they were part of your club had their scores aggravated, that was put in parentheses. It was not used for rankings, but for bragging purposes. And we did pretty well with that. Uh, Last year on our field day site, we were just six Delta. To, to explain what that is, Delta class are home stations using commercial power. Uh, prior to that, we were using, we were nine alpha, which was a club station, portable, emergency power only, and QRP. So uh, we got to use the multipliers to really punch up the score. At six Delta, we could not do that. And uh, what we decided to do, since we proved we can compete, I mean, uh, Number two nationally was as good as we were going to get, and we were doing we were doing it consistently. We decided instead to change field day into uh, something for the newer hams, especially a chance to participate in contesting, in taking part of what the original purpose of field day was, which was a simulated emergency, essentially setting up a station and trying to contact as many others around the country as you could. And uh, so last year we had enough people and enough equipment to operate as six Delta. And basically we wanted to cut down the number of stations so we can keep them manned. We can keep uh, the more, the uh, uh, older hams, <laughs> the, uh, the more experienced ham, shall I say, as mentors so that all the new hams could come and try this and see if they found that contesting was their cup of tea. And quite a few did. Um, so we did have a six Delta operation going on. And we did pretty well uh, on the field day site itself. We had uh, points of 4,898. And uh, by the way, we were running 100 watts instead of QRP. And again, that was for the new hams. Instead of sending out a weak signal and calling and calling on sideband and waiting for a response, we figured if we go with 100 watts, they're more likely to get feedback. So not as much as a multiplier, but it, we're making it more fun for everyone, less frustrating. So we had 4,898 points, but if you include the aggregates from everybody in the club who was working at home and declared they were part of this organization, the total came out to 6,034 for that. We didn't do too shabby because uh, unfortunately they don't do like they used to on, uh, on uh, field day where they would give you a uh, searchable database to figure where the rankings were and everything. Instead, it was one very large uh, PDF. So I had to do the searching myself, you know, uh, to find it all. Uh, we turned out to be uh, number 13 nationally. So that is not bad, not bad at all. And uh, my challenge for us this year is to uh, get us back to our rightful place in the top 10 <laughs> in the country like we've been doing for the past years. Uh, club score itself, if you just look at that 4,898, in North Carolina, we were number six out of all the participating stations within uh, within North Carolina. So again, not bad. So that's another challenge there. Let's let's try to do better than that. Now, one issue we're going to have this year is we're not going to have as many personnel as last year. So manning six Delta is going to be very difficult. And I think it's better to have fewer stations where we could have people manned working multiple bands or modes in each of those stations and uh, not have to set up as much, have uh, have people be able to ban or rotate between stations. You know, if you find you've had fun doing 20 meters, you want to see what's happening uh, on 40 meters, walk over there and help them out. You want to go to uh, do some phone and then go to digital, you can go to that. So uh, we're... We want to make it more fun for everyone. And we also want the new hams to not just operate or learn how to, how to contest, but also 
the other part of uh, field day is helping set up the stations and uh, you know the setups, putting up towers, shooting lines into trees, uh, putting a station together and testing it to make sure it's working, uh, working fine. That that's all stuff the the uh, the experienced TAMs can help you with, and believe me, they'll also appreciate having all the extra help to uh, set up all these things. Any before I go on, any questions? I know I'm throwing a lot of questions, a lot of information out very quickly. So, all right. Well, I'll give you some more information for this year. This is what I know so far that we have we can operate with. Um, for CW, we're going to have the MCU, and I think this is the last year we will be using it uh, on on site there at Wilson's property. And yes, this is Wilson Lamb's property, W four B O H, where we will be operating again. Uh, we will be a Delta station. Uh, we probably won't be six Delta. We're looking at four Delta, maybe five Delta this year, if we have enough equipment and people operating, uh, able to operate. So what I have so far is for CW in the, uh, uh, that's telegraphy, in the, uh, in the MCU is Wilson. Uh, in the garage, there's going to be two stations set up side by side, which uh, I'll be captaining the digital station there. So we'll probably be working FT4, PSK31, maybe some other modes. Uh, night right next door to it will be another station, which will be single sideband, at least 20 and 80 meters right now. This is what we had last year. The other advantage of the garage is for those uh, persons who uh, can't get up steps or anything like that, because of all the trailers, any work they had in the barn, you had to go upstairs. If you needed uh, accessibility, because of physical limitations, the garage is great. Con concrete pad, you can come right in and operate there. Uh, the other station we have, that's three so far, is uh, Joe Simpson. Uh, Joe, raise your hand in the back, there he is. He's gonna bring his trailer and set up a, uh, a mast and they'll be operating 40 and 15 sideband uh, next to the pond on the property. What we won't have this year is, uh, there's also a barn building there are steps, it's air conditioned in there, but uh, that's normally where the uh, 10 meter station and uh, I believe, uh, Dan, you were doing 15, uh, 15 digital back then as well, 15 and 10 digital. That's open right now. So uh, the, that's, uh, that's available if someone wants to take that on. We have a returning member, John and for SJW, who's gonna be bringing a portable station out there. So we could figure out where to parcel you out, John? Which sideband? Uh, probably sideband mostly for you, or or whatever. Okay. Well, that's the other thing. I'm going to be polling all the potential band captains to see what they want to do because we don't want to make people do things they don't want to do. That's not fun. Yeah, we want to help help them pursue their interests. So uh, John's going to have a station out there. So it looks like we may get the five delta done after all, and. Uh, they, there will be power drops run out to all the stations. So if you don't want to rely on just battery, we, there will be power drops out there. So you will be working off commercial power. Uh, one of the disadvantages of that is unlike when we're using full emergency power, we don't have some of the bonus points we used to have. But we're hoping to make up for that with using 100 watts of power and keeping this fewer number of stations manned for the 24 hours that uh, it, it will be going on that uh, will increase the score over last year and everybody will have a good time with it. Any questions so far? That, that's, that's the initial plan of logistics. Uh, I'm going to confirm all this. So over the next few weeks, you're gonna see me putting out a lot of emails on the list and getting confirmations from folks as to what their plans are, what kind of station they're setting up. Uh, and then it's not all just operating, it's also that very important thing, uh, food. <laughs> the biggest social event that these two clubs hold together was the Friday night potluck at Field Day. So uh, Field Day itself, the, the dates are the, on uh, Saturday, June 24th to Sunday, June 25th. It's on from 2 p.m. Saturday to 2 p.m. Sunday. So full 24 hours were on. However, as of the previous day, as of Friday morning, we could start doing our setups. And that's the big setup day. And uh, a lot of people like to come in, many hands would make light work. The whole idea is to get the towers uh, put up, get the, um, get the lines up in the trees, get the preliminary layouts done so that uh, 
everybody gets it done. They're not going to get exhausted by uh, trying to rush at the last minute and get something going. And then we spend Saturday morning doing the final testing of the stations. And, uh, and at two o'clock, we're off to the races. So there'll be some more speaking on that. Uh, Dee, do you uh, have preliminary plans for doing, uh, helping with the meals? I know you're gonna need help uh, doing it, but uh, coordinating meals. Great. Actually, let me bring you the mic here. So, so actually most of the work has been, been done by Gene Edelman who with the purchasing and then we had various volunteers actually cook the food and then Dan and I did some of the logistics. So is that gonna? Okay, well, I, I'll, I'll have to, I'm not gonna do it alone, but if anybody likes food and would like to form a partnership, you know, we can, we can get 10% of each meal for ourselves or something. Yeah. No. <laughs> Okay. We'll make, we'll make it a priority. Yeah, the, the, the tricky part is, okay, so, so just if I may, we try to keep the costs down. So the tricky part is knowing who's going to be there. If you, we had one year, we had somebody new do it and they didn't know what they were doing really. And we ended up, the club had to subsidize the thing for $300 because uh, he got much too much food and it's partly, well, anyway, I don't want to get into details, but to keep it, we, we tried it last year and last 20 years, we've had it for $5 a meal, Saturday night and Sunday morning, two meals. It'd be nice if we could do that again. Of course, costs go up. So maybe this year it'll be $20, no, $5, six. I don't know. Anyway, we'll see. Yeah, thank you, Dee. And uh, part of the... Uh... Part of the discussions up the coming week will be working out uh, that kind of logistics as well. So, uh, because the meals are important. And uh, the other thing, it's a safety issue. So we want to keep people fed, but also if it's very hot, we want to keep them hydrated as well. So in the garage, there will be a continuing supply of uh, cold liquids for everyone to uh, indulge in. Uh, let's see what else. So certainly, Bruce, Bruce has a question here. I have all of the laptops. I got them from Steve and I got the other two from Steve today. So I think I have eight laptops. Um, one of the things when you're getting your questions answered, what software? Okay, so I'll just make sure they're set up for right now. I've got N3FJP and N1MM on them. They're all updated. They've got the latest release from Windows 10 and, uh, and the updated software. But I'd just like to make sure that I rename them maybe, you know, so we know what laptop will be covering what band and things like that. Some notes about passwords. And so if I just know who's doing what, then I can get them configured before we leave because we'll be out of town too. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Bruce brings up a point as well. It's not just operating. We also have to uh, log what we've done. <clears throat> and very likely, uh, well, I'll say we will. We will be using N3FJP, which is a field day. It, it's a dedicated software for field day. And uh, N1MM is great, but if you're a new ham, it, there's it's a bit of a learning curve uh, to, to work that software. N3FJP is very intuitive. You look at the screen and... Uh, I will be willing to hold a tutorial on it for folks who need it. Uh, we might not, I don't know if I'll have time at the June meeting to do that, but those of you with Zoom capability, I'd be more than happy to uh, put together a Zoom presentation and walk you through doing N3 FJP. It's, it's really very easy to use. There will be a laptop from the club at each operating point. So uh, uh, Ideally, you'd have an operator and a logger working in pairs at the station, but it's it's so easy to use that, uh, you know, I've, I've done the typing with one hand on the digital station, and on the other hand, I'm logging into contacts on the N3FJP. But again, it's more fun if you have someone to work with and talk with in between contacts, and uh, and you could swap positions. One person could operate and one, one doing logging. Uh, those laptops will be in my custody once uh, once uh, Bruce has le left, and uh, I'll be handing them out to all the different stations there. And one of the things I will be showing you is how to do your backups on your logs. So just in case something goes wrong, 
uh, it, it's all saved. And at the end of field day, I walk around to all those laptops anyway with a little thumb drive and take all the backups. And uh, uh, N3FJP will allow me to take all those and merge them together. Question. Yeah, if you're working at home, if it's a, if you're doing the aggregate uh, scoring, I'll, I'll get into that. But basically, you're doing it on your own at home. Uh, you can use whatever software you want. We just want to be. Uh, some people asked me from last year, "Do you know who did the best on uh, on the home stations?" I says, "You know what? I really don't know. I'd have to dig that out from the PDF." So probably this year, I'm going to ask everyone who's a home participant to come in on that email list and tell us how you did. And we could, uh, if, if members want to be ranked, we can do that. We can see who did well and who, who, still, uh, who still needs to work on things a bit, or you know, especially if they're new. Your new target is next year to do a little bit better. You know, that, that's how we've always operated field day. We've always tried to do a little bit better than we did the year before, and that's worked fantastically for us. I think only one year we had because the propagation was so bad, we had a little we had a little dip, but so did everybody across the country. So <laughs> any other questions? Dee? Yes, I did mention the pot. Yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate again. Now, now what Dee was speaking of was that uh, for, for $5 a head, it might be a little bit more this year. Uh, people can uh, buy into a, uh, a uh, meal, you know, it's usually grilled foods, burgers, hot dogs, whatever, on uh, Saturday night, and then breakfast on Sunday morning. The Friday night potluck is all us. It is a potluck. You bring your specialty. Uh, usually Wilson puts a few uh, pork butts into the smoker there on site to anchor it. And uh, everybody just has a grand time. And it's not just uh, the hams there and whoever's helped on site. Families come out too. It's a big big social event. So uh, we'll be uh, putting together a, uh, a, uh, a list for people who want to uh, say, hey, this is what I'm bringing. So, so we don't get 12, 12 trays of deviled eggs and, uh, and, and, and nobody brings anything else. We'll try to coordinate things a bit, uh, whatever your specialties are. And uh, usually with the pot knock, there's enough leftovers to hold us over for lunch the following day and so forth and so on. Uh, John Boone is willing to help again with a lot of the uh, preps preparation work. And usually in the past, he's also made a sandwich run for the uh, workers on Friday to, uh, uh, you know, stay, stay, uh, stay well-fed and, uh, and uh, hydrated as we uh, do all that work. Any other questions? Bruce, can you think of anything I left out perhaps? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, like I said, we're looking with the current uh, the current number of people we have, probably a five delta operation. If we need to scale it back to a four delta, it just means we're going to put more bands and modes on fewer stations. But uh, we'll make it work. And uh, again, we're going to try to make it fun for everyone. Last call for questions. All right, uh, sir. Uh, who's going to be the electrician of the? Good question. Uh, Dee was asking, if Dan is not here, who's uh, not there uh, this year, uh, who's going to be the electrician? We'll find, I guess we'll have to look for volunteers, people who are skills in that, uh, in that area. area. Quite standard, uh, we, we didn't hear that. <laughs> this will all be part of the mailings I'm doing out this week. We're going to look for volunteers for all different aspects. So not just operating and being a band captain, but also with the help of the logistics of, uh, of, uh, op of the, the field day operation itself. Well, thank you all and just keep your uh, eye open on the email list and we'll, we'll get this worked out. Thanks. Thanks Dave. I, I did think of a couple more things now that, uh, that Dee brought up the power. Um, ground rods, I think Dan was actively involved with Wilson and the ground rods. So there's the ground rod pounder, putting in ground rods, pulling out ground rods. So there's a lot of prep that goes in that many folks don't see that just happens by the select group of three or four people that some of us are not going to be here this year. Um, 
you know, I would like to be there. This is my second year in a row. I'm not going to be, and you can blame it on our oldest daughter. She seems to have these kids that uh, keep graduating from high school. So we're going to be in upstate New York at uh, our oldest grandson's high school graduation. But the good news attached to that is our next oldest grandsons, we have two more that will be graduating, but there's a three-year gap. So we, we didn't get enough time to tell her how to schedule the kids when they were born until she got past the, you know, the first three, and then we got a gap in there. So we're going to be in upstate, and Bob has a question. Let me wander out here. Where is that? Uh, maybe you can get them to hold back a couple of years. <laughs> I don't think my daughter would like that. Might help with the college bills, though. Actually, the first two are on full scholarship, so that's working well. Okay, any other questions before we move into the next program? Okay, chat. Wait a minute, Brian has a question. A question about the, like the uh, ground rot thing. Yep. Days before or... When is that? Good question. So Brian's question is ground rods, when, days before or when? Um, there is an advantage. And the advantage, I think, is something that will have to be scheduled with Wilson. Since we are, will be operating in D class, we're not limited to the 24-hour setup. We can set it up tomorrow if we want to. Okay, I mean, what D class, if you're operating from home, Chances are you're not building your station that Friday afternoon to go on Saturday. So depending upon Wilson, and this is probably a good email, Dave, to find out from Wilson what he might need done on the property. Usually there's some help needed to do some mowing and get it ready for field day. Um, you know, there might be a crew that he might want to get together after it's determined, is it 4D or 5D? What bands, where are they going to be located? What can be done in advance? So Brian, great question. And it's highly probable that things won't need to be put up right away, Friday, some things. Um, I've already done both of Wilson's beams. I had them over to my house. I set them all up. I, I adjusted them. He's picked them up. They're ready to go up. So um, maybe some stuff can get done in advance. But it all has to be taken down Sunday. So the crew needs to be there. Questions? Yeah, I'm going to ask a new guy's question. If I've got seven feet of copper rod pounded down into clay, how the hell do I pull it out? <laughs> okay, the answer was right. Barry had the answer to that question. The way you get that seven feet out is you pound it down in farther so you don't trip over it and go to the store and buy another one. Um, I, I assume that the home stations are all D. So even if we have provisions for emergency power and all that, it doesn't count. We can't get any multipliers. Um, no, that's untrue. Yeah. What you, you can run any classification from home that you want to, except like you can't run your, like you're an EOC. Okay. It's any, any classification for single op. Um, you can get all the classifications. Just go out to the ARRL website and look at field day rules. And it'll give you a listing of all the classifications. The only thing needed to aggregate your score is to make sure you use the right club name when you submit your own. People that operate from home will be answering Dave's email. This is what I did, how many contacts, et cetera, et cetera, whatever he asks for. But he's not going to want your Cabrillo file or your, uh, you know, whatever fi uh, format file. Okay. You're going to be submitting your own to the ARRL, but you need to have Orange County Radio Amateurs and DFMA or whatever the, the name will be, which you'll also let everybody know. So you can operate five watts QRP if you would like, or you cannot operate more than a hundred because one of the changes with, AA, with field day this year is ARRL's limited the power, regardless of classification. So all the, all the kilowatts that you guys were going to bring to the site, you don't need to worry about where you're going to get the 240 volts. Anything else? Okay, excellent. And I used to know who did what from home, but I can't remember now. But I know the top four were Howie, Pete, and Bill. Or top three, rather. Howie, Pete, and Bill. And I'm not sure, you know, and they were all CW stations. And, Sherry did well on digital, absolutely. Yep. 
but I'm not sure. I don't remember right now who else operated from home. Dan, oh, Dan last year you did? Okay, because I know two years ago you were way up there. Okay, I, I thought you operated in a barn. Okay. I'm a, I, well, you're before you got a lot of digital contacts because you, well, Dan, so one thing that Dan and I did, which is fun, and maybe some of you folks that are operating from home might want to do this. We do have a club Zoom account if you don't have your own Zoom account. And we were on Zoom, okay? Dan and Lori and I, we operated, you know, single station, but dual ops. Dave, I think Sherry was coming in and out. Uh, we were on Zoom all the time. And not only was it fun to be able to see what everybody else is doing, you put the pressure on the other person. They can't go to bed if you're not going to bed. They have to sit in that chair and keep operating. So that really helps with the score. It is. It, like Davis, if you couldn't hear this on Zoom, it's fun to see what everybody is doing. And, you know, it's really great. You might find out, hey, this other band is open. Now you can jump to it, too, because, you know, you can both be operating 20 meter CW or 20 meter sideband from home because you're not mm -hmm. 15 feet apart. So if another band opens up or something, you know, it gets really hot for, for FT4 or something, you can operate that same band from home. You just can't do it on site. Mm -hmm. And I also have the uh, band pass filters, Dave, which I haven't checked out yet, but th those will be matched up with the uh, uh, laptops. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Um, the next part of this meeting will be put on by <laughs> Charles and it will be about chat GBT. We have all been hearing a lot, probably, if you've watched any of the news, about all the good things that artificial intelligence is bringing us. Some days I feel like I have most of artificial intelligence, not real stuff, but strange days. But Charles is going to talk to us about chat GBT. He is going to do it from home. So we will unshare. Oh, no, we won't unshare here because we've got his presentation, right? So we will flip over to Charles' presentation and he can have the floor. Charles, it's all yours. Okay. How's everybody this evening? And I hope uh, hope you can hear me okay. Can you give me a thumbs up or okay, please? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> you, know, uh, you know, my topic is going to be about chat GPT instead of GBT, and I get it backwards all the time too. And one of the things I did not find out is what the GPT stood for. But what we're going to talk about a little bit this evening is the overview of artificial intelligence. Now I got asked by a guy today, well, what do you know about the topic? And I said, well, I'm a political science major, and I don't know a darn thing about, about the technical back end or anything like that. And I've been accused of not having any intelligence to begin with. So uh, I'm, I'm disqualified on quite a few counts, but we're going to give it a whirl here. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, now what is artificial intelligence? intelligence excuse me. Well, basically there's no, there's just no uh, agreement on what it is. It's pretty much an umbrella term for a lot of different technologies and a lot of different ways to approach things. Um, I think that the most thing that we, that we would say is that if somebody was doing it, uh, this is what we, a human being was doing it, this is what we, call, what we would call intelligent behavior. And in a uh, machine or an artificial environment. Um, okay. Now, uh, next slide, please. Now, we want to talk a little bit about the history of artificial intelligence right now. Uh, you know, it's been out, really, it's been out for a long time. Uh, it's used for large data set analysis. And what they do, they looked in in uh, patterns, and all those patterns, they make predictions on what's going to happen. Uh, you know, you've got things like, uh, you know, Google does a lot of work, data analysis work, large set data analysis work. Uh, you know, uh, the intelligence community certainly does a lot, a lot of work in, in, in large data set analysis to, uh, 
identify uh, patterns and uh, make predictions based upon what they're seeing in the patterns. Uh, I used some sort of software, I can't even remember what it was. Uh, we were doing uh, like Tivoli Event Manager, uh, which is a software that you would use to respond to, uh, uh, monitor and respond to uh, uh, equipment failures on, on computers. And we were doing, I never really got good at it and quickly, well, quickly we, we moved on to something else. Uh, but, you know, it was some sort of a learning thing, too, that you had to do. Um, but it was a, uh, you know, the history of this stuff is you're doing, been out for a long time. It's mainly been used for patterns predictions, uh, like uh, Palantar is a good, is a software program you hear talked about quite a bit in the intelligence community as far as data analysis and, and stuff like that. So um, what we really want, and the, what's really making a difference these days is uh, the generative AI concept is that really you're taking all this analysis and this data and making something out of it. Either you're writing new code or uh, a script for a movie or a song or anything that you want to. Uh, and really they're doing it now that mimics human, human intelligence. And that's, I think that's really got what's, what's got a lot of people's attention. And I'll tell you another thing that I think brought it go is really bringing the public's knowledge here at the end. Uh, so if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, you know, one of the one thing, how does, how do you, uh, one of the classic tests for uh, determine if it mimics human intelligence is it's called the Turing test. And it was invented, no, shoot, invented. It was invented back in the uh, 1950 by the Alan Turing, I believe that's his first name. I know I got his last name right. But he was a British polymath. I mean, the man was gen a, a genius by anyone's measure. He was a cryptanalysis. Uh, he was part of the code breaking team of Benchley Park that did a lot of work on breaking the Enigma uh, ciphers in World War II and developing a lot of the early uh, computers and computer concepts on, uh, and usually really using electric and electric processes and elect that eventually evolved into the computers we have today. Uh, and he came up with this test, if it, if it could fool a human being that it didn't know uh, with a conversation that it, that it was a machine, he decided it was, he said that was a test for intelligence right there. But it's, it's curious to find out that he really didn't really care about this test at all. Uh, he said it really wasn't important in anything he would look for. He said, because machine intelligence might be so different than our intelligence that we wouldn't recognize it for what it was. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, please. Oh, no, how does it learn? How does artificial intelligence learn? I mean, that's the key, the key thing that you're seeing these days. You're, you're building it. And it's feel like you're running a like a twelve line uh, do loop or something that you know right in code uh, computer code. If anybody's familiar with that, is that it might run twelve times and exits out. You know? uh, well, the thing is, is that is that this darn thing machine. It's called what machine learning, and it just keeps adding to the code and improving. Based upon different iterations of what's going, what's uh, what what's going on with it, uh, you know, you you dump a, what they're doing is uh, right now is the hot thing is the large language models called LLMs, and this is what Chat uh, GBD run, <laughs> G, 
GPT runs on is a large language mo model. And um, you know, I flipped over and, and, and try to read up on it, but I'm it gets into quite high level mathematics. And you're talking to a guy that can't even balance his own checkbook. So, uh, but, uh, you know, you dump in a large amount of data and it's almost like the old saw that, you know, you give them, uh, Chimpanzees, you give enough chimpanzees a typewriter, and eventually they're, they're going to crank out Shakespeare. And uh, a large language model, what they're doing is they're pretty much predicting what the next word should be in a sentence or a paragraph. And you dump enough data at the darn thing, and it'll it'll uh, it'll pop up and and uh, and give you an answer that sounds pretty good. Uh, it might not be right or not. <laughs> uh, like here it says, doesn't work, know the word meaning. I mean, it uses the words, the constructs of whatever language it's running in to predict what the next thing should be. And one of the uh, inventors of the program says it's a super high, high fidelity autocomplete system. And um, we know what kind of problems that, that brings upon. Uh, if any of us has used autocomplete or, uh, or, uh, or spell check or anything like that back in the good old days, we used to call it spill chunk. But uh, these days, it's a, but what they're trying to do is go for the, uh, the, uh, the um, artificial general intelligence or AGI. So how do we interface with this super smart system? If I could have the next slide, please. How do we interact with it? Uh, it's called a chat bot. And that's all the, uh, what you see in chat GPT is, that's how we interact with it. And this was released to the public in uh, November 20, 22, in other words, last November. And it surprised the scared to be Jesus out of a whole bunch of people on how, to, how on its ability to create songs, code, and TV and music scripts, and also uh, like press reports and uh, uh, like PR reports and things that people that write for a living journalists uh, we're doing to make make their money, <laughs> and I think that's one of the reasons you hear a lot about it today. Is it definitely has the, the uh, ability and scaring to death out of people that write for a living, and uh, so you hear about a lot of it in the news right now. And uh, maybe you know some of you want to see these people go away and don't like the press or whatever. Or, uh, or th this, that, and the other, but you know, we're talking something make make a wholesale change in the uh, in the in, in our economy and environment and environment. Excuse me. So, can I have the uh, next slide, please? So, I'll talk. You know, sum it up with the problems. And of course, this thing we have, we see three little pictures right here. Uh, of course, there's good old Arnold in the top right-hand corner as the Terminator. Well, you know, we just darn well might invent the uh, uh, Skynet, kill a robot scenario. The one on the left is a is a riot, and uh, in case you guys think this is our the Antifa riots or whatever riots uh, uh, that you want to think in the uh, in the summer, well, uh, this is the uh, yellow shirt, yellow vest riots in France in uh, a couple of years ago. So that's where that photo came from. And of course the bottom right-hand corner, that's just, you know, that's a stock slide that came with this uh, projector set. And uh, it kind of represents really nothing happens. You know, I didn't have one that showed the uh, flowers and unicorns and rainbows, but you know, Nothing really big happens. Me, I think the uh, the uh, social unrest and social change is going to be our biggest biggest problem involving with this. Uh, 
I don't think quite. I hope to God, you know, if we, we end up with someone like the Skynet and he gets all mad at us, I mean, we're in seriously big trouble right now, but that's pretty outside of things going to happen. But some people in, the, in that will uh, will argue with on that. Uh, you know, we take a look now, and I think we'll also another thing we're doing is we learn from social media just how big of an impact that worldwide technology and worldwide instantaneous communications can affect people. And, you know, we brought a lot of people rolled this out hoping it would bring people together and we have a big hug fest all around the world. And that's not what happened. And I think a lot of people are recognizing that and they really want to pump the brake a little bit on the introduction of artificial intelligence. And, 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 you know, make sure we've got a handle on what its impact is going to be so we don't run into these uh, uh, really, which I think terrible things that have happened, uh, dividing societies around the, the world and dividing our society and making us cluster in smaller and, 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 and smaller groups. And, you know, and so I love thy neighbor when you have a situation quite a bit like hate thy neighbor. Um, you know, we've got problems with deep fakes, which is use of AI to create uh, uh, almost real, I mean, just quite real photos. Uh, I looked the other day, uh, they had a thing on the New York Times with uh, showing about three or four different uh, photos. You had to pick which one was fake and completely computer generated and which one was real. And I, I picked the wrong one every time. And uh, it's just getting to the point now that even the experts are not going to be able to tell, uh, you know, is it real or is it them or actually you're old enough to remember that. Uh, and the thing that really scares me the most is that this is gonna make a, a crook, give him the perfect set of tools uh, to scam people. Uh, you know, anybody that's been in it, that got the got the Nigerian prince letter email in the email that you know hello I'm a Nigerian prince and I have like millions of dollars if you deposit it in my bank account etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and of course they have a lot of problems with that uh, um, thing but one of the things you used to be able to the English was not grammatically correct. There's a lot of indicators in it. You know, they're not native English speakers and they're trying, trying to pass themselves off as one. Well, they're gonna come up, they've already got systems right now. They can uh, be your grandkid, call you from your grandkids, what you think your grandkids telephone number and, and with their voice say, Papa, and even now they're, pictures they can say oh paul i'm in a nigerian prison please help me and get me out and people are going to get scammed right and left on that darn thing um also i think we're gonna have a lot of problems with the uh, uh impact on uh, the, our economies and who does what uh you know first you know a long time technology changes were thought to be good for us because it gave us opportunities to work better jobs and get paid better. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to run into a problem with what they call the superstar effect, like the one LeBron James of accounting or uh, movie making or whatever is going to be, they're going to take that guy and uh, clone him a million times into, a, into artificial intelligence machines. And he's going to be the best your artificial intelligence are going to be the next the best thing than to harm the uh, uh, LeBron James, uh, uh, you know, uh, accounting firm to do your accounting. Uh, also, uh, a big, big impact on these white collar jobs. And we're already seeing it. One of the things that you're seeing in the uh, Screenwriters Guild strike that's out in California not even California, it's in, impacting the world's, anybody that's covered under the Screenwriters Guild uh, production has shut down. 
And that's one of the things that they're scared to death about. They're seeing the handwriting on the wall that it doesn't take very much, a great deal of talent to write a very, a pretty good television script or soap opera script. And uh, they're afraid of all these guys that's doing all these journeyman movies and televisions and say things like even uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, television for like training. Uh, they're going to be able to work because a, a chat bot can, can, uh, can uh, take their jobs. So it's a scary world, folks, and we're part of it. And But uh, at least we're learning. Uh, you know, it's going to give us plenty of opportunities and plenty of challenges in the world in the future to come. And uh, my uh, suggestion is, is uh, hang on, it's going to be a bumpy ride for for a few years and until we can at least get a good handle on the direction it's going. So that pretty well concludes my presentation and I'll be well, I'll be happy to entertain your questions right now. And I'll do a little bit of demonstration too. Okay, so we have, first off, do we have any questions? Yeah, we got one. Let me walk over and get the, the mic to Dave. Okay. I'm curious what kind of ham radio applications we could have here. Since the Supreme Court said that uh, corporations are people, then why uh -huh. can't a machine be a person? And uh -huh. then we could have, you know, a chatbot on the other end. We could assign him a call sign, and he could be <laughs> part of yeah. our club, and he would never get tired for during contesting. Yeah. So, so let, yeah, let me answer that. I was going to answer that with with three letters, th two letters and a number. F T eight. That's about as close as you're going to get to a, a robot as you as, as exists. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I know where you're coming from. We don't see. Uh, I had to, and honestly, where this call, where this uh, talk came from, is that uh, I was going. I'm getting ready to do a presentation on DMR. So I was like poking around. I thought, hey, we got this chatbot thing. I want to learn how to use it. And uh, so I started plugging in DMR questions into it. And it was, I thought it was pretty good. And then the more questions I asked, uh, I was noticing discrepancies and, and you're quite running into the garbage in, garbage out problem with it. Now, will we use it? Will I use it for in ham radio? Will you use it in ham radio? I don't know, but maybe all the design of the equipment might be done in ham radio using this. All of your manuals that you get will be written by chat bots. So all the technical writers will be able to work and uh, things like that. Uh, maybe even all of your, you might, uh, you might be able to clone a very, very good tech, uh, 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 say a, a, a technical guy like uh, uh, Paul or uh, Charlie and ask in sell Charlie all around the world in various language and you could be, you could chat up your uh, AI Charlie with different questions and and uh, you know Charlie and his inheritance inheritance might get a lot, and these heirs might get a lot of money out of it, but the new guy on the block that wants to take over in Charlie's place, he might be out of work and not be able to get a job. So that's, I think that's going to be the immediate impact of the ham radio community right there. Any other questions, comments? Yep, we got one on the other side of the room. Okay, and that'll give me a chance really to pull this thing down here. It's good exercise for me. Okay. Uh, Charles, uh, on Saturday, you gave us some examples of, for the group that was on Zoom of what it can do. Can, can you uh, mm -hmm. either show yeah. us something like that? Or well, that's I think it'd be reading. interesting for those, you know, I, all I know about chat buck, I've gotten from Zoom. So uh, yeah. maybe some people yeah, can see what it can do. I'm getting that right now. So if I can uh, share my screen, if I can find out where I'm at here. Okay. Charles, we got about five minutes. If you can get it in five minutes, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Let me get you real quick here. Okay. I'm going to log in, which I knew I only had five minutes left. I would have done a long time ago. Let's see where I'm at. Log in.
Okay, everybody copy down his password and user ID here so we can log in as Charles. Yeah, right. <laughs> Looks like you need some AI to get it done. Uh, uh, Charles, I don't know what's going on, but the screen here looks frozen. Are you putting in something there to yeah, sign hold it? On. Yeah, it, it has my password. <sighs> Zoom on Saturday, I asked it to do a biography of Bruce. Mm -hmm. And I, it said you were born in 1967. 72. 72, right, right. right. But but it, it spoke very highly of his uh, expertise in the ham radio field. And he's he's been a inspiration to hams around the world. I wish I had the text because it was it was beautiful. I was really impressed. And I think it was accurate. So aside from your birthday. So, so you can tell by that that there's a, probably going to be a lot of fake news and stuff going on. Oh yeah. And so, oh, no. so, so Bruce, that means you'll last forever then with this AI. That's right. I can last forever stuck in a computer somewhere. <laughs> okay. There we go. Yeah, it also means I don't really need us at all. <laughs> I hope not. Okay. So let's see what we got here. So here's all the different questions I've asked it so far. Start out of the Pearl Starship module. Well, let's slide up here. So we go ahead. Okay. Here's a uh, chat I did with OpenAI. And uh, Please create 20 to 25 minutes on how to use you for research and amateur radio subjects. And I thought this was pretty cool because if you look at it, it's, it's a nice little, it generated and gave me a good answer right there. Here's a question I sent, chat body over. Everybody read the screen. I, I guess that's a no. Okay. So the okay. question is, chatbot, are you able to watch a YouTube video and summarize its contents? And the answer is, as an AI language model, I don't have the ability to watch videos or access visual content directly. How I can use, however, I can use my natural language processing capabilities to read a transcript or summary of a video and provide a brief summary of its content based on that information. So if you provide me with a transcript or summary of the YouTube video, I can certainly summarize its contents for you. That's a long word to say no, but I can help. <laughs> okay well i think we're bumping up against the end well matter of fact we're a little bit over time okay but thank you for your time people and uh thank you for your attention and uh let's chat sometime okay Bye. thanks charles appreciate it mm -hmm. Okay, um, let us jump back into the agenda now. And I think we go with officers updates. And I know Dan had something that he wanted to share. So let me, you come, wanna come up? You want me to bring you the microphone? Okay. Here you go, sir. This is actually re relaying a message for Fred, uh, KN4QBZ. And I don't know if he's still on Zoom or not, but there's going to be an exercise uh, this coming Thursday or next Thursday, May 11th. That's this week. This jump in the lake exercise. And it's not you jumping in the lake, which might be fun. It is down at Jordan Lake, but it's the U.S. Army Airborne Brigade. And I think these are their qualifications that they have to do uh, for water landings to, to maintain currency for that. And, you know, we've talked about taking the 100, 200, and 700, and 800 courses and learning all these ICS documents. That sounds like kind of a dry subject, and how does that relate to anything? You go to one of these exercises, 
you not only will see the documents, you will want them. They basically, it tells you what's important, who's going to be there, what the objectives are, what your role will be, who you should be talking to. It's a great learning opportunity. And once you see these, you really appreciate the value uh, that they play. And you don't have to take a course to learn that. So I would highly recommend um, participating in this exercise. Uh, there's signups. They need two more people. Uh, sign up. You can sign up for 7 to noon or noon to 5 p.m. Uh, Bob, W4FK, is participating. John, N4SJW, is participating. I would be participating, except I've got a conflict that day because they're fun. They're down on the lake. Um, you meet a lot of interesting people. The EM staff, there are fire departments there from about three to four adjoining counties. Uh, Comtex, I even had an interesting conversation with one of the EMTs who was a former Learjet pilot. I mean, it's a fascinating group of people, and I highly uh, recommend. Um, basically, what our role is... Um, there's a drop zone of which cannot be seen uh, due to trees and other things um, throughout the, the entire length of drop zone. So some of us would be spotters on the water's edge. And if anything, uh, we're taught the signs. If a paratrooper is doing this, he's got a problem coming down. You need to report that immediately. And a little bit of training about that. And um, there'll be uh, one of the communications people with the incident commander. And there's always food, so I highly recommend it. I mean, what else? That's what the ICS forms will tell you all that. There will even be maps. And, and these are, are sent out to the people who are participating before you leave your house. And Fred, uh, are you still on Zoom? That's all the people left. Anyway, he's a com L and he's okay. Okay. Uh, but this is information you will receive. If you sign up, you'll get this information. You'll know where to go. You know who else is going to be there. I mean, if you go through the forms, which I won't do now, it's kind of, okay. This tells you this, that tells you that. And, and you go there, you know, it kind of eliminates a feeling. I've never been to one of these and I don't want to look like an idiot. And I heard uh, a emergency management director talked about going into Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico after one of the hurricanes and just running into absolute chaos of a situation, what you thought was going to be happening. But basically, these forms kind of get you back on the feet where you can become somewhat produ productive in solving you know, the most urgent problems quickly. Yes. So it's if somebody wants to participate, they need to get in touch with Fred, correct? Okay. And is Fred going to send something out to that? Or, okay. Okay. And and this is not a question that hasn't been talked about. Say I wanted to participate. What do I need with me? Do I need a radio that does this or doc or paperwork to do that? Uh, there have been brief sheets for that. What you need to bring now. Um, I could look through this one here, but um, I just, yeah. yeah. Would they be able to, or do they have to be pre-qualified with certain radio equipment? No, I would say if you got a two meter, basically we will do this with HTs, two meters more than likely. Uh, so there'll be some simplex. We may try to do some DMR. We also use a f application on a phone signal. You don't have to have all of those, but that would be a part of, um, you know, kind of the lining up the roles and capabilities. Well, hey, Dan. I heard a, hey, Dan, where was that from? Up here, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Go yeah, ahead. Uh, how do we get a hold of Fred? That's the big question. Okay. His, uh, we'll put this in the, minutes but uh, his email i'll spell yeah. this phonetically golf victor india lima lemur oscar foxtrot at sign papa mike period mike echo send him an email
Proton mail. Proton mail. Question. <laughs> Shit, a really check, good check, question too. Check yeah. Yeah, they won't be out. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll send out. A, we'll make sure we send out another another email. There will actually there will be another exercise May twenty fourth, and I definitely plan to participate in that. They're fun. Yeah, I got my question. Back. So the recently Fred put together an, a, a document that showed as a kind of a parallel activity that we were using when we were doing our Saturday repeat, repeater reachability test that Mark was running for us. Um, is that the if we had that document? If we distributed that document with Fred's contact information, to the that would answer the question about what repeaters might they be using for two meters for for seventy centimeters, what simplex frequencies they would be using, so people can see if they have the radios whether they would need it or not, they would know what would need to be programmed in the radio, and that's kind of a stated assumption. Question something. <laughs> It's a standard part of ICS. The ICS 205 has all that information. Uh, generic names, what repeaters, what frequencies, PL tones, and uh, there's a, I guess it's a 205A. Yeah. For example, once people have signed up, what your assignment is in this case, uh, uh, observer, uh, distributing the Viper radios, first, last name, call sign, phone number, email address. That, that's the whole purpose of the ICS documentation. You're asking good questions. And if we keep saying it's in the ICS documentation, that, that's a good test of whether or not everything's been worked into it. There's another question on the floor. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah, the uh, email I have, it's going to be the 145.230 uh, repeater. I'm not sure on the appeal on that. And some simplex channels. Also recommended bringing a chair, water, a big hat, and sunscreen. <laughs> and a new phone for Joe since it's just bounced off the floor. <laughs> yeah, so turn that gravity down. Okay, so that sounds like a fun exercise. Saturday is supposed to be a nice day. We're not supposed to get any rain, I think, until sometime next week. So not only will it be an interesting exercise. Oh, well, Saturday's going to be nice also. But it's 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 Thursday. Okay, I missed that. Sorry. Okay, so those of you that are still working, sorry. <laughs> okay, any other questions for uh, Dan? Any other comments from the floor or from Zoom? Anybody? Any other officers' comments, board board comments, or comments in general? Okay, meeting's over. The meeting yeah. is over. Outside of his ham radio pursuits, Bruce Spire has led leads a fulfilling life. He enjoys <laughs> spending time with his fellow operators, exchanging stories, and building friendships within the amateur radio community. He also appreciates the beauty of nature and often combines his love for radio with outdoor activities, such as portable operations and field days. Bruce Meyer's dedication, a... expertise, and passion for amateur radio have made him a respected figure within the ham radio community. His commitment to advancing the hobby, assisting in emergencies, and sharing his knowledge have left a lasting impact on the amateur radio world. With his call sign, N1LN, Bruce <laughs> continues to explore the boundaries of communication. <laughs> It got it knew your call sign, Bruce. Uh, yes. Uh, it's quite obvious that's a plant. One, one, one more sentence. Bruce continues to explore the boundaries of communication, connecting with others, and leaving a legacy in the fascinating realm of ham radio. So, so I'd really like to thank you, Mark, for that. But I think. That is a perfect example of, art, of fake news and artificial intelligence creating something that is slightly different than me. And those of you that know me know that's slightly different than me. A lot different. And <laughs> Lori, what? Oh, Charles has a comment. Charles, go ahead. Oh, me? oh yeah, I was just saying it. Uh, one thing is jiggo, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and... I would have caught that pretty quick if it had anything in there about how his love for digital communications. 
but you know, I don't know. I don't even think the artificial intelligence could you could have stuffed that down on it or not. <laughs> so, if I took, did I tell the story about how I worked the last DXCC entity that I needed to work? Mm -hmm. That yeah. it, I, you guys on Saturday heard that, but I don't know if the room heard this. So, I needed one more FT8 WW for my work every single DXCC entity so I could get my top DXCC, right? So we had a board of directors meeting one night and I had configured one of my K3s so I could actually run FT8. I got, I downloaded WSJT, you know, I, I don't operate digital as Charles said. So I've got this thing working and I'm looking at the screen and I figured out how to work it. And I mm -hmm. set the radio up and I, okay, I'm copying FT8 WW. All right, and I turn over to, and I move the transmit frequency to what looked like an open frequency on the mm -hmm. waterfall. And I mm -hmm. turn to my other computer screen and I'm on the, the board of directors meeting. And then I hear a <laughs> beep, beep. And I turn back around and my computer worked FT8WW for me for the <laughs> last DXCC entity I needed to have them all worked. Hmm. I did confirm it manually though. Wow. I did do that. But not, not being happy with that, I did work them on CW afterwards, too, just to get that. But I didn't even know I was working it. That's why I like <laughs> FT8. Okay. Any other comments, questions, anything FTA. going on we need to... Steve, yeah, you want to... FT8 do doesn't really count. Go ahead, Wilson. FT8 doesn't really count for DXC. FT8 doesn't really count for DXC. Spoken as a true CW app. Okay. Any other comments in the room?